Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to spring 2021 semester at CSUSM. As you all know, we are virtual again. Hopefully this is our last virtual semester um, as we continue to roll out the vaccine and control the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so my name is Richard Armenta and I'll first start out by telling you a little bit about myself, but this is uh, Kinesiology 404 uh, or kind uh, or uh, introduction to epidemiology. So if you didn't log on to the right place for some reason, um, you're welcome to stay and learn a little bit about epidemiology today or email me later. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with some PowerPoint slides first to introduce myself and then the goal of today um, to let you all know we're going to go through the syllabus. Uh, we are going to do a lecture on kind of what is epidemiology, go through some of the main concepts of epidemiology, do a few breakout groups, and I will uh, answer any questions or anything that you all have. Um, so one thing too is if you have any questions while I'm talking, uh, you can chat those in and I will be monitoring the chat as best as I can while also talking and going through slides and so on. You're also welcome to just interrupt me. So one thing I know, and I will say this right away, is I will occasionally start to talk too fast because I just get excited about the material or about what we're talking about or whatever it might be. So if I am talking too fast or if you want me to explain something again or if you're just confused by a concept, never hesitate to interrupt me. Either unmute yourself and just say, hey, professor, professor, can you stop really quickly? I, I'm, I'm confused or I want you to go over that again or chat in and I will do my best to monitor that. Um, this time that we have together in this live session uh, is meant to cover the concepts and also ensure that you're understanding them. And so we can't do that if you're not asking questions, if you're not engaging with me and each other, and if we're not all actively participating uh, during this time that we have together. And I'll talk about the format of the class when we go through the syllabus in just a moment, but you, I know many of you have already gone through the syllabus, you've taken the syllabus quiz, so that uh, you kind of have a little bit, uh, you know a little bit of what to expect throughout this semester that we have together. So as I mentioned, my name is Richard Armenta. Uh, you can call me Richard, you can call me Dr. Armenta, you can call me Professor Armenta, whatever you prefer. Um, I typically go by Richard, um, that's, that's my uh, preference, but I know many students may not be comfortable calling me that. So Dr. Armenta or Professor Armenta is also uh, acceptable as well. I am, so the reason that I'm teaching this Introduction to Epidemiology class is because I am an epidemiologist by training. So I did my PhD in epidemiology at UC San Diego, so not too far from Kelsey San Marcos. And I did my MPH in epidemiology at San Diego State University as well, so local. Um, I've been very fortunate to do all of my education and then to now have a job as a professor at Cal State San Marcos uh, and do that all in San Diego County. Uh, because I love it here, right? And who doesn't love the weather other than the rain uh, the last couple of days that we had, though I will say occasional days of rain, especially when I don't have to leave the house, are actually very welcome. Um, and, and so it's nice to be able to just kind of cozy up and not have to worry about anything. Aside from my degrees in epidemiology, I also got a master's in arts in Latin American studies from San Diego State University. Um, and then I have my BS in biology and my BA in psychology also from UC San Diego. Um, and so that master's in arts in Latin American studies fits in in many ways. And you're probably thinking, well, that's very odd considering all of my other degrees are in public health, epidemiology, biology. Uh, but it fits in because a large portion of my research actually focuses on health of historically excluded and minoritized populations. Um, and a lot of my research, especially during my education, focused on the unique aspects of us living in a border region here in San Diego County, where we're on the busiest land border crossing in the world, with uh, thousands and thousands of people crossing the border every day between uh, San Diego County and Tijuana, Baja California. And that has implications for our health in many different ways because there are shared behaviors, there are shared cultures, there are shared exposures. So if we think about things with the global pandemic that we're currently facing, 
the fact that we're on a border region complicates our response to that global pandemic because of that constant movement of people between two different cities in two different countries across a border and the interactions that we have between the two countries. And we can't just shut down that border to not allow people to cross uh, regularly because people come for school, for work in both directions. And so we have to think about how that plays a role, not only for the current pandemic that we're facing, but also for other health behaviors and for other health conditions that we face on a daily basis. And so you'll notice, and I'll talk a little bit about my own research um, throughout the class, but not only has my research focused on how living in this unique region on the busiest land border crossing in the world affects the health of people on both sides of the borders, but I also do a lot of work for understanding how communities are affected by the systems and the places that surround them. So right now, my active research projects are really focused on working with local American Indian communities. If you're not aware, San Diego County has the largest number of reservations of any county in the United States. We have 18 different American Indian reservations in San Diego County that all have unique cultures, um, unique governments. They're all sovereign nations that uh, govern themselves and unique aspects that not only affect their health, but their daily lives, their economic viability and many other things. So my research focuses on addressing the health disparities that American Indians and Latinx communities face uh, in the United States and how those impact uh, their daily lives. Because we know, and you'll see throughout this class, that certain populations in, our, uh, in the United States are more drastically affected by adverse health outcomes than others. And thus, to me, it is imperative that we do things to address those adverse health outcomes in those populations to ensure that they have equity in their access to healthcare, that they have equity in their um, ability to protect the health of individuals and communities, and that they are able to engage in health-seeking behaviors, which there are many things that impede those that we will talk about throughout this class. And so that's a little bit about my research. That'll kind of come up a little bit as I talk about different aspects of epidemiology and how I apply some of the principles that we're learning about in this class in my own work to give you relevant examples for things that are being done locally in San Diego County. But then we'll also talk about research in, in, uh, broadly in the field of epidemiology and what epidemiology does to protect the health of the population. Aside from kind of all that more educational research side of things, um, you'll see a slew of different pictures on the slide that I am sharing right now. Um, I have two dogs and a cat. I would have them come in right now, but they would just make way too much noise. So they will, they will make a, uh, a presence at some point, especially my cat. She loves to jump all over my keyboard and my desk and have her tail and butt in the camera, especially in the middle of teaching or in meetings. So that will inevitably happen throughout this semester. Um, I, we, I also have, my husband and I also have a five-month-old son. His name is Xander. He's pictured there. He was uh, born during the pandemic. So that actually made last semester even more interesting on top of us being virtual and working from home, but also having a newborn at home and figuring out parenthood for the first time. Aside from that, I love to be active, um, be outdoors. I used to do, when I was a, a, an undergraduate myself, I was on the triathlon team. So I still do a lot of running. I try to bike when I can, though, especially now that doesn't happen very often. Uh, I love to be outdoors, hiking um, and doing other things. And I also used to be a competitive salsa dancer. Um, so I still will occasionally dance that we can't do that right now with the pandemic. Um, other than me just kind of dancing around my house <laughs> with my son. But uh, those are the things that I like to do kind of outside of this like academic world and work world. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. Um, on the syllabus quiz that you're all taking, if you haven't taken it already, I do have a couple questions where I want to get to know a little bit about you. One of the things that I hate about the virtual environment more than anything is that we don't really get to interact as much on a regular basis because we're on opposite sides of a screen, right? So you're all in your homes or somewhere else that is comfortable for you to be listening to this lecture and engaging with this class and I'm in my home. We're not in a classroom where I get to talk to you before and after class. 
class or I get to see you on a regular basis. So I know like many of you, I miss that in-person interaction. And I know it's impossible to replicate what we would do in person in a virtual environment, but I will do my best to at least try to make some of this as engaging as I can, given that we're in this virtual environment. But that also takes you all being engaged as well, as much as you can. But I know we're all in different living situations and different family situations. You might have family walking around behind you so you can't turn on your camera, or you might have siblings or, or other things going on. That's all okay, right? Come as you are, learn what you can, and I will work with you. Um, the other thing that I will say too is that um, I also want to, the way that I will try to get to know you all at least a little bit, and you'll see this on the syllabus, which actually let me help go ahead and just pull up the syllabus now so that we can start to kind of talk about some of the important things for the class is um, I will get to know you all in office hours or what I call them as student hours as well. So if you've gone through the syllabus and take, taken the syllabus quiz, you know that you are required to um, visit me in virtual student hours twice throughout the semester with your first time being sometime in this next two weeks of the class. And so I'll kind of scroll to that section and I'll come back up in just a moment. So this student hours section here, you're required to attend um, my virtual office hours. If you can't make the times that I have set right now um, for my virtual office hours, that's okay. I can schedule a time outside of those couple of hours to meet with you individually. Um, you can do that by emailing me or I also have a link to what's called Calendly on the syllabus and on Cougar courses. With that calendar, you can click on it and it shows you my schedule and you can pick a time that works for you and it sends both of us a link to that time to be able to meet. Um, so either way works for me, um, but the purpose of these student hours is for me to be able to get to know you a little bit. Uh, you don't have to come with a question about the class. You don't have to come with a question about school. You can literally, because I often, I've been requiring And we were virtual, uh, so students would have to come to my office. And I started doing this for multiple reasons. One of the main ones was that I know most of you are probably, or all of you, I think, are juniors and seniors. And I'd have a lot of students who were in their last year at CSUSM who would come into my office where I would talk to you before or after class and say, this is the first time I've ever been to a professor's office hours. And that to me was always very shocking to hear, especially for students who were like, I graduated in three months um, and I've never been to office hours. Um, and that to me is problematic for multiple reasons. One is we as faculty members are here to help you. That is literally part of our job. And aside from that, that is what we're passionate about. I am here to help support you not only in this class to do well, but also in your time here at CSUSM. So utilize us as resources to be successful in your classes, in your career, and so on. We are always happy to talk about things that you can do to make you more competitive for graduate school, for jobs, or whatever that might be. So oftentimes office hours for me with students turns into talking about graduate school or students coming and saying, I'm not quite sure what I wanna do after I graduate from CSUSM. These are some of the things that I've been thinking about. Do you have any suggestions or do you have any um, feedback for me or whatever that might be? I'm happy to talk about all of that stuff or say you're just dealing, you're struggling right now because we're in this virtual environment and we've had a lot of our support systems taken away because we're in this virtual environment. If you need someone to talk to, I'm here to talk to you in office hours and beyond that. If there's things I can't help you with because I can't do everything, I will do my best to refer you to the people who can. So part of that is to ensure that you know that I'm here to help you, but also to get to know you a little bit because I don't get to see you in person. So that's why I wanna see you all in this first couple of weeks in a five minute, that's all it has to be. They often turn out to be 15, 20, 30 minutes, depending on how the conversation goes, but it can literally just be check in, how are you? How's everything going? What do you need? And you're like, I'm good. I don't really wanna chat. Uh, okay, cool. And then we move on and that, you know, that's, that's fine. I prefer it to be a little bit more substantial than that, but I understand that we're all kind of in different situations and comfortable with different things. 
So you'll notice that I will say things like this a lot where I am here to help you. Utilize me as a resource. I want you all to do well in this class. And I've set up my syllabus in that way as well so that you see not only that I'm available here for help, but also that there are a lot of resources on campus that you can utilize to help you as well. Um, so make sure that you are, for instance, if you think you might need more time on exams or for assignments, make sure that you are uh, seeking help from the Office of Disability Support Services and getting those resources that you need because they can help you ensure that you're successful in your classes. We have tutoring centers, writing centers, we have an academic success center on campus. Those are all developed for you for your time here at CSUSM, so utilize them. Um, I'm not going to go through the learning outcomes, um, but I will kind of, I, I have this uh, couple paragraphs in my syllabus about learning during a pandemic as well. We are not in a normal time, right? And we've, we've heard this a lot. We're in unprecedented times, right? But, but it's true. We're not in a normal time. I know when all of you signed up to come to CSUSM, I can bet that none of you signed up to be in a completely virtual environment taking all of your classes. And if you're like me, I know when I was an undergrad and when I was going through my schooling, virtual classes just weren't ideal. And I often did not do well in the virtual classes that I took because that wasn't how I learned and that wasn't what I had signed up for. And so I know that we're in a unique time. I know that none of you signed up for this um, and I'm very understanding. And I, want, and I know that we're all, may, that many of us have been either directly impacted by COVID-19 or who may have family or friends that have been directly impacted by COVID-19. And that is very fresh and that's very real. And that is impacting our well-being. That is impacting our performance. That is impacting many things. And on top of that, this virtual environment often adds a lot more work and a lot more things that we feel like we have to do, right? And so if there are things that you need, if you're having trouble, please reach out to me early and often. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to think less of you. I am here to support you and to ensure that you have what you need to be successful during your time in this class and beyond. So please reach out to me if there are things going on that are impacting your performance in this class and beyond. More than anything, I want you to learn something in this class and I will do my best to ensure that you are learning about epidemiology and why it's important. And that has become, it, why it's become more important since we've been in this pandemic. And I'll tell you one of the things that has been both exciting but also not great is more people know about epidemiology now as a field, and I'll ask you all in a few what you know about it. But at the same time, there's also a ton of misinformation about what epidemiology can and can't do, how it can be used. And there have been times because of the response to the pandemic where the field of epidemiology has been kind of uh, uh, villainized or it's been looked down upon because there's so much misinformation out there about what is going on. Um, so hopefully I can combat some of that and talk about why epidemiology is such a useful and important and great field, and maybe even convince a few of you to go into it after this as well, even though coming into this class, I know most students are in, in kinesiology, right? I know a lot of students are like, why am I taking an epidemiology class? I don't understand how this fits in with my other biomechanics and, and exercise physiology and all my other kinesiology classes. And hopefully I'll also be able to uh, talk to you about why it fits in as well. Um, as I mentioned, co uh, course format wise, so we are going to have live sessions every single week. Uh, these live sessions are going to be meant to both introduce material, but also go through exercises, have a discussion, have breakout rooms, and engage with each other as a classroom. Um, there will be times in the live sessions where I will just kind of give lectures and talk about the material and take questions. Today's lecture, today's session will be Fairly, you know, I'm not going to talk too much, but it, it's going to be more like let's introduce some stuff. Let's talk about basic epidemiology, have you on a couple breakout rooms um, to talk to each other and go through a couple of things as well. 
Um, so there'll be live sessions. They're always going to be recorded. And then the day that I that we have the live sessions, I'll post that recording on Cougar Courses. You'll notice in the syllabus that for the live sessions, you are only required to come to six of the live sessions throughout the entire semester. Those six are part of your grade. You get points for attending. I get attendance reports from Zoom that tells me whether or not you were here and how long you were here. So if you log in for two minutes, you're obviously not going to get credit for that live session because you weren't actually doing anything in the live session. Um, but I set it up that way. So we're going to have weekly live sessions, and I highly encourage you to attend every single week because they will be useful. They will help you be successful in the class. But as I said, I know that many of you have lots of other obligations and family things and situations that make it hard for you to be here every Wednesday from 930 to 11 a.m. And at a maximum, we'll be here till 11, but on many of the days we'll only be here till from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. But I say till 11 for days that we have a little bit more activity going on. So you're probably wondering then how do I get the course content? So you can watch the recorded live sessions, but aside from that, every single week, I am posting asynchronous videos that have all of the content that you need to be successful in this class. So those asynchronous videos are required regardless if you attend the live sessions every week on Cougar Courses, and I can pull up the Cougar Courses website at some point during today's session. There will be between one and four videos that are posted that are anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes a piece with typically every week there won't be more than 45 minutes of recorded material. That is where you are going to get the majority of the kind of lecture type material for this class to help you prepare for our live sessions. My recommendation, as you see in this figure that I created, is that you watch the recorded lectures and you read assigned readings before you attend the live session. Some weeks, not starting for a few weeks, there's going to be a short five minute quiz that will kind of test your comprehension of that material. Those quizzes, you're gonna be able to take as many times as you need to, to get 100%. So they're basically, everyone should get 100% on all the quizzes, because if you get an answer wrong, you just take it again and you go until you get it right and you review the material. That is meant to help make sure you're prepared for our live sessions. And then after our live sessions, you'll complete the homeworks. And the due dates for the homeworks are all on the syllabus. I'll show you those in just a few minutes. Typically, homeworks are going to be due on Sunday night at the end of the night, so 11.59 p.m. Um, so what you have to do is, I'm getting a, my internet's unstable, so sorry if I kind of freeze for a second. You have to watch the asynchronous videos. Those are required. You're going to get content there. You have to read the assigned readings, do the quizzes when they're assigned, come to live lectures, if you can't come to them all, that's okay. As I said, you have to come to at least six and then do your homeworks and other assignments that we have for the class. And we'll go over those in just a moment. So are there any questions about the format of the class or what you're expected to do to do well in this class? All right, I'll take the silence as a no. Um, so, I'm sorry. Really quick question. Um, did you say that there was exams or no, like large exams or? Yes, there are two exams. So that's all I'm gonna talk about right now. I guess, sorry. Oh, no, you're good. You're sorry and you're cutting out and I don't know if that's me or if that's you. So, but I heard exams and what they were. So yeah, gonna... no, I, I, my <laughs> internet's kind of bad. <laughs> so, so is mine. I mean, I, yeah, it's a great way to start the first week, right, is to have some internet connectivity issues when we're in a virtual class. <laughs> um, yay. Um, so uh, here's what you're going to be expected to do <laughs> to do well in this class. Yeah. Um, so there's homeworks. There are uh, five homework assignments uh, or maybe six, five or six. I'll show you on the schedule. That will be due uh, every couple of weeks. We'll go through everything you need to for the homework um, during the class. And we'll go through lots of examples to ensure 
that you are comfortable doing the homework, everything that you need to know that you know, and so on. So I'll make sure that you have what you need to do on the homework. There are the quizzes that will, there's uh, eight different quizzes. Uh, like I said, they're five minute quizzes. You have an unlimited number of attempts. So you're gonna get full credit on them if you just do them and you go through some of the material. Um, so that's second thing. There's a project that you'll do throughout the semester um, to kind of sum it up. The project will end up by the end of the semester, you'll have about a four to five page paper. It's not very long, but you're gonna submit it in pieces. And then the very final submission will be everything pulled together as a final project. So I'll give you all the instructions and details for the final project next week. And we'll talk about that a little bit and you'll see the due dates for that on the syllabus. The student hours, which I already talked about, you're required to attend two throughout the semester. They're worth 10 points each, so they won't drastically hurt your grade, but they will if you don't attend them and you're on a borderline grade. And then exams. There are two exams in this class. There's a midterm and there is a final exam. So the midterm comes about midway through the semester um, and that will cover everything up until that point in the semester. And then the final exam is during our assigned final exam by the university, which I'll talk about in just a moment. The final exam will technically be comprehensive where it will cover the entire course. But the caveat to that is that it's largely focuses on the second half. And the reason I say that it's comprehensive is because you will see that everything in this class builds on itself. And so we can't ignore concepts and things that we learn in the first half when we're talking about stuff in the second half because they're very related to each other. So a lot of the concepts that we learn about will carry forward and so you'll be required. You can't just take the midterm and say, sweet, I know all that stuff, I'm good to go. Let's now focus on the second half because it's also related. And so we'll, I'll give you more details about the exams as they get closer. There'll be a combo of multiple choice and, and short answer. Part of the exam will be take home and part of it will be on Coover courses where you'll log in during a specific time and take the exam. Um, they'll be about two hours long before the exams. You, we will have review sessions. The class period before every exam is all review. We don't introduce new concepts at all. And then that whole week leading up to the exam, I will hold additional review sessions outside of our normal class time that will allow you to come and ask questions where I'll go over sample problems and so on. I don't post what is a traditional study guide for the exam. Instead, what I post is sample problems. And what those sample problems are is actually previous exam questions from other classes that I've taught this kind 404 for. And basically what I do is I take exam problems off old exams and I put them into a sheet and I give them to you all along with the answers so that you can go through and make sure you know how to do them. And if you know how to do the sample problems, I, will, I can guarantee that you will do well on the exam itself. And so we'll continue to talk about that as it gets closer. Um, and I'll make sure that you have all the resources that you need to do well on the exam. And then the last thing is just the um, live sessions that you have to attend. So like I said, you have to attend at least six of them throughout the semester. But as I said, I highly encourage you to attend all of them if you're able or the majority of them is if you're able because they will be very helpful for you to do well in the class. Um, so any questions about exams, homeworks, assignments, or other things that you're expected to do for the class? And you could chat in too. All right, here's all the points breakdown. So if you wanna know, you know what everything is worth, there it is. I'm not gonna go through all of the course policies and expectations. I expect you to read through those on your own. I'll kind of just say a couple of caveats about them. Um, so one, uh, in terms of academic and professional integrity, we're in a virtual environment. Uh, so for all the exams and stuff, they're open note, open book. You can use all of the material that you have for the class, for the exams, for the homeworks, for everything that we do, except for 
your fellow students. So all of the work that you do, so for exams especially, they're individual. You're not supposed to work together. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to monitor that yet, like while you're taking the exam. But I will tell you, it's often very evident when students work together on an exam. Um, and I have caught students cheating on the exams the last two semesters because it becomes very evident in this virtual environment. I do not want to have to deal with uh, cheating allegations. You do not want to have to deal with cheating allegations. At the very least, you would fail that particular assignment that you cheated on. At the worst, you could be kicked out of the university if this is something that is major. It's a long process, it's not worth it. If you're struggling, if you need help, if you're not sure what to do, please reach out to me. And pre please reach out to me early. I am here to help you. It's not worth cheating and not worth having to go through that. I know it's tempting and it's super easy to be taking an exam and to text your friend who's in the class or to email things across. It's just, you know, like I said, it's not worth your time. It's not worth my time. So please reach out to me if you think you need support. Aside from that, in terms of expectations and things, um, what you'll notice in terms of what I have in the syllabus and learn, in terms of learning difference, access and accommodations, and also with my diversity statement and remote learning tips. For me, expectations and what I expect is that we're all respecting each other that we're all engaging in the class and that we're all willing to engage in respectful and difficult conversations. One of the things that we will talk about a lot throughout this class and a theme that you'll see throughout are, are things such as how do racism and discrimination affect our health? Uh, and we're gonna talk about a lot of what would be often controversial topics within public health, we're going to have difficult conversations about some of the national narratives that have been going on over the last year or so and how they impact health and how they're related to epidemiology. Next class, our second lecture is on what we call social epidemiology and uh, social determinants of health, where it's all surrounding how the experiences, the things that surround us, how racism, how discrimination affect health. And so if there are things that you disagree with, that's fine, I'm open to have a lively discussion about that in a respectful manner. Um, but what is most important is that we're respecting each other's viewpoints, you're respecting your classmates' viewpoints. Um, and from my perspective, everything that I teach about is going to be based on the best evidence that we have available from research. I will keep my personal opinions out of it and I will talk about and say in research, this is what we see and how these things impact health. And this is why it is important for us to understand and address these issues. And so I, my goal is to give you the current and the best evidence that we have um, to understand the health of the population because that is the goal of epidemiology. And so I will always come to it from that standpoint. And one thing I always do in this class is I always share my own biases. And what I mean by that is that we all have a different perspective of how the world works based on where we grew up, how we grew up, our cultural background, and so on. That perspective will impact and shape who we are and how we view things and what we deem to be important. And it will also shape discussions that we have in research, in epidemiology, and in other fields, it is extremely important that we recognize those biases that we have and how they impact the way that we move forward in the world. And so I will always share when I have those types of biases and the perspective that I am going to provide and how sometimes that might change the way that I potentially discuss things because I believe that that is important to do when we're just talking about certain issues. So for example, an often hot, too often hot topic issues, healthcare and vaccinations. I firmly and strongly believe that healthcare is a right and that every single person in this country should have access to healthcare and that there is no way that we are going to be able to protect the health of our communities and of individuals unless we give everyone equitable access to healthcare and the ability to see providers on a regular basis, but not just to see a doctor, to see a doctor who looks like them, see a doctor who understands their culture, and see a doctor who speaks their language. 
that is an extremely important part of our health and of addressing what we call health disparities or differences in our health, which we will learn about next week. So some of the ways that I discuss things, that bias will come out because I will have a very, you know, I'll talk about the research and it will be very much like, this is what we see and this is why we see that. But you'll probably see in how passionate I get about some of these topics that I firmly believe that. And part of that is because I grew up without healthcare. Um, I am Mexican, Cuban and American Indian. And I grew up with a father who is a migrant farm worker. We had no healthcare. We had no doctor that we went to on a regular basis. I saw not only how that affected my own family, but also the community that I lived in. And that is why I'm so passionate about doing research to address these issues. So that is part of the perspective I have. I recognize that. And I recognize that many of you may not believe or may not think that saying that healthcare is a right. That's okay, let's have an open debate about it and talk about the data and talk about how these things affect health and communities and the costs and all of those things. Let's do that um, likely in an office hour or a separate time because that's we don't really talk too much about policy in this class, but it does come in a lot because we can't separate health from policy. And unfortunately, we can't separate health from politics. So there will be times where we will start to talk about some political subjects because our health is drastically affected by the political environment that we live in. Things that we have access to, policies that are put in place, they all trickle down and they affect not only your individual health, but the health of your family and the health of communities. So that's, that's important. Funny. It's funny you say that because I actually just tore my rotator cuff and uh, our insurance said that they would pay $50 of uh, the MRI that's like $800 and it's like $50, like, <laughs> you can afford that, so. Yeah, well, and that's like, one of the things, medical debt is one of the, uh, is the largest reason for bankruptcy in this country. So people going to the doctor and getting hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical bills and not being able to afford it, it's one of the major it. reasons like for pricing for it. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, but. it is, and it affects our health every single day. Yeah. So these are the perspectives that I'll bring. And the other one I'll say is, um, and, and I always say this caveat, um, and especially with COVID-19 vaccine coming, uh, being administered right now, vaccines do not cause autism. There is zero scientific evidence that vaccines cause autism. If you want to have a debate about this, I will happily have a debate and a discussion about the evidence that shows any link between vaccines and autism but I would like for you to come with actual good quality peer reviewed scientific evidence that shows that vaccine cause autism. Um, and that's something that to me, unless you bring that type of evidence, there's no discussion to be had because our current scientific consensus based on the current evidence is that there is zero link, zero association, no causal association between vaccines and autism. And so again, I come at all of this from a data perspective, right? Reading the research, understanding the research. And I'm going to empower all of you throughout this semester. And a lot of what we'll talk about in epidemiology is how the research is done, what type of research study was conducted. And based on that research study, what does that tell us? And how can we use that evidence to change policies, to do interventions to protect the health of populations, and so on? And so I want to empower all of you throughout this semester to be able to be good consumers of research and of literature to understand population health. So that's my kind of soapbox that I will always go on for every class to kind of show you the perspective of where we are and, and where I'm coming from. Um, and again, like I said, always open for discussion. I, I know that sometimes that people are like, well, I disagree with that. That's okay. I actually encourage you to disagree with me and I encourage you to have discussion with me because, and, and we'll have some of those in the class because that's how we learn, right? We learn through interactive, engaging discussion and being able to talk about these issues and being able to respect each other's position. Um, and being able to change our position. So one thing that you will see is that, and this is something that happened with the COVID-19 pandemic, is early on in the pandemic, there, there was not a recommendation to wear masks because we didn't have enough evidence about how COVID-19 was spread and whether or not masks would be effective at preventing the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. 
And so that initial recommendation was masks aren't needed because we don't know if they're going to work. And there can be times where putting something into place if we don't have the right evidence can have the opposite effect. However, there was a large communication issue with the use of masks and they were later recommended because the research was done and we understood how COVID-19 was spread better and we understood how masks can protect and prevent the spread of COVID-19. So recommendations went into place. But a lot of people who don't understand the full scientific process and that we don't make recommendations or change policies until we have the evidence to support that, continue to go back to those initial recommendations from the start of the pandemic and say, well, you were wrong. You said we shouldn't wear masks and you were wrong when you said that. So why would I wear it now when you initially said not to? One of the most important things with science is that we have to be willing to adapt and change our knowledge based on new scientific evidence and change our recommendations. We're not always gonna get it right the first time. We're gonna have, we have to continually do good quality studies to understand what is going on. And so that's something that I encourage you all to do too, is know that sometimes one recommendation one year might say this, but then we continue to do research and it's gonna say, uh, you know what, that's not that great. So we need to change this. What we also need to do is ensure that we're communicating that well to the public and the people who aren't educated in epidemiology or in science and who don't understand how that process works. So lastly for the syllabus um, is the, you know, everything on here, there is a book, it's optional. You do not have to read it, but I always provide, it's free online. Um, I always recommend reading the book because it provides a different perspective that will help you understand the material. You do not have to read it to do well in the class. You, there is nothing that I will test you on that is only in the book. Everything you need to do well on homeworks and exams is given in both the asynchronous lectures and the live lectures. Um, you'll see all the due dates for the assignments. One thing you'll notice is I have goal due date. Um, with the exception of the syllabus quiz, and then the exams and a couple of in, the, in this final project thing, everything has a goal due date in this class. What that means is that due dates are flexible. What I mean by that is that what I, so the student hours you also have to be completed by this fifth. But for example, homework one has a goal due date of Sunday 2-21 at 11.59 p.m. I rec that's my recommendation that if you're gonna stay on top of material and do well in the class, that you submit it by Sunday 2-21 at 11.59 p.m. However, if you're not able to submit it by then, anything that is assigned before the due date, that before the ex midterm exam that has a goal due date can be submitted up until the date of the midterm exam. So if you need an extra day or two or an extra week to complete homework one, you can submit it, no penalty, no questions asked, nothing you have flexibility to submit them when you're able to, because maybe that day you have, or that week you have an exam or lots of other things going in other classes, or you picked up extra shifts at work. So most things have this flexible goal, goal due date in terms of homework assignments. That's great for you being able to work around your schedule. What I highly caution you against though, is do not put everything off until right before the exam. If you wait and you submit, everything with a goal due date before the midterm exam and you don't do it until two days before the exam, one, not only are you gonna be scrambling to get those assignments done, but you're also not gonna be able to do well on the exam because you're gonna be trying to teach yourself this material very last minute. Same thing is true for after the midterm where everything has a goal due date. And as long as you submit it by the final exam date, you get full credit, no questions asked. But again, don't let work pile up. And if you need help, if you have questions, let me know. The other thing is, you know, if you submit the homework one by the goal due date, I will get them graded by the next week or within two weeks. If you don't submit it until right before the midterm, obviously I can't grade it right before the midterm. Um, and so you may not know what your grades are on things until very late. I will say though, I'm typically pretty lenient on grading homework assignments because they are meant for you to practice and to understand the material. 
we are going to go through a lot of brand new concepts for you. This class is going to introduce a lot of terminology, a lot of concepts that you've never heard before because it's the only epidemiology class in the program. So that being said, it might feel a little bit overwhelming at times, but that's why I'm here to support you. And we have homeworks and other in-class exercises to help support you as well. So, and then the other kind of last thing too, I don't know, that I, so I have no control over the final exam time, but I'll tell you this too. So the, the final exam is technically scheduled for a Saturday at from seven to 9 a.m. Whoever on the university campus thought that was a great idea, I don't know. Um, I don't, <laughs> especially with a five month old son at home, uh, 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, not great. But what I'll tell you is actually, you're not gonna be required to take it specifically during that time. Um, the final exam and the midterm exam, what I do is you get two days to take it. You'll, I'll open it up on Saturday at 7 a.m. You'll have until Sunday at the end of the day to take it. So Sunday the 16th at 11.59 p.m. Once you start the exam, you get two hours to complete it. But you can choose any time in that two-day period to start the exam. So if you don't want to wake up at 7 a.m. to start the exam, you don't have to. You can do it at 10 p.m. on Saturday night, or you can do it at you know 5 a.m. on Sunday morning or something. So I, I give flexibility in when you can take it. So this doesn't this this time doesn't really matter that much because you don't have to take it at that exact team time. Okay. So. I've just talked a lot about the syllabus and expectations. What questions do you have? Uh, just to reiterate, the, the times to sign up for the individual meetings are on Cougar courses, correct? Uh, so you, there's the link on the, so you can either email me. So there's two ways you can do it. Well, three ways you can do it. You can either just come during my normal office hours, um, which are, are, when are they? Uh, let's see, let me look on the syllabus. Mondays from one to two or Thursdays from 11 to 12. So you don't have to make an appointment. You just show up and you come to office hours. So you can either show up during one of those times or there's a uh, link in the syllabus and on Cougar courses to what's called Calendly. And I just saw that somebody signed up for an office hour using it. Um, so thank you for doing that. You click on it, it takes you to a website that has um, basically my schedule out in 15 minute blocks. If I have another meeting, it doesn't allow you to sign up during that time. So you click on it, you put in your name and your email address, it sends you an email and it sends me an email so that we can both get on the Zoom at that time to talk. Or if neither of those work, just email me. Um, if Calendly is not working for some reason, shoot me an email, I'll respond. And I will say, how about this time? Does this work for you? Um, and we'll fight, figure out a time that works. So any of those three options worked for scheduling. But do so early um, because I do have a lot of meetings. I teach other classes, I have lots going on. So if you wait until the day before the, off the student hour is required to be done, there's a very slim chance that I will actually be able to pitch you in to my schedule. I, I have lots of time throughout the days and weeks, and there are times if something just doesn't work, I'm willing to do it after 5 p.m. or on weekends, I'm willing to jump on the phone or on Zoom or whatever, um, but let's try to schedule something during eight to five first, and then we'll go to those other options later. So, cool. Thank you. What other questions, anything else? I have a question. Um, what kind of calculations can we be expecting from this class? Yeah, so you are going to have to do math. That's a good question. You're going to have to do math, um, but it's um, mostly basic calculation. So most of what you will have to do will be addition, subtraction, division, multiplication type stuff. You'll have lots of formulas and things that you'll have to go through. I will give you lists of formulas. We'll go over how to use them, but you're gonna be calculating rates, ratios. You're gonna be calculating what we call odds ratios and relative risks and other things throughout the semester. The math itself is fairly basic. Um, it's actually really easy in general but it's the kind of understanding the problem and setting up and knowing why you're calculating it that becomes a little bit more conceptually difficult. So that's what we will focus on because a lot of times it's actually just plug in the number with the formula, punch the numbers in your calculator, you have the answer. But where students normally get tripped up is what numbers do I plug into the formula? 
So who is my population or whatever? So we'll go through a lot of that. And week three is where we first introduce calculations in this class. Um, and it's a lot. So the, I will tell you right now, week three content, there's a lot of recorded lectures and we'll do a lot of sample problems in class. It's super dry. Like literally the recorded lectures are me going through like, here's how you calculate this rate. Here's what infant mortality rate is. Here's what this is. There's no way to make it exciting. I know that. Um, it's just, it is what it is, but you have, they're important calculations, not only for this class, but a lot of these calculations will be things that you have seen, talked about in the media, talked about in research papers, and probably have thought about like, oh, what does that actually mean? So we're going to actually go through how you calculate them and what they mean and how you use them to help you um, understand them and, and be better consumers of, of research and beyond. So cool. good question though. What else? Um, do you know if we use that, uh, I think, proctor exam thing, or do we not use that at all? No, I, I, to be honest, I really dislike those uh, types of proctor exam things. Like I said, so I, I go on the honor system. You're going you're gonna to have those two days to take the exams. Take it on your own. I caught students cheating. It's usually pretty obvious to tell, but I personally think that those proctor exam things that are filming you are super invasive and inappropriate. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I know I wouldn't want to be taking an exam while someone is there's a camera pointing down on me, um, yeah. and so on in my home. Um, and and on top of that, I'm sure you've all seen like I don't I don't have a TikTok, but I've seen them on like Instagram and stuff where like there's someone who has the proctor exam and their friend is sitting just out of the camera, like basically like signing them or like showing them things with the end. Like, yeah, there's yeah, so yeah. Many ways to get around that type of stuff. It's like why even bother? Um, just do the work on your own, right? Like it, it, you're here to learn. And, and a lot of this stuff, you know, there may, there's going to be things in this class that you're like, why am I learning this? I don't, I don't really care about this. I don't know how I'm going to use it. There will be a lot of stuff that many of you will be like, oh, this is super interesting, or I didn't, I never knew how this worked or what this was, and I've heard about it, so this will be great. But we're here to learn, and 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 I'm here to support you. So just if you think you need help, reach out. So, awesome. Cool. What else? And then I'm. Well, let's take. Then we'll take a couple minute break, and then um, I have some lecture content to go through, and we'll end right at eleven today. So. Um. Are your quizzes gonna be like the syllabus quiz, where it was kind of more like a survey? No. So the other quizzes will be um, all on Cougar courses, and they're just gonna be like five multiple choice questions, typically. Um, so the syllabus quiz is more of like I want to kind of get to know you and make sure you've actually read through the syllabus and stuff. Um, Cause what I want to try to avoid with some of that too is like, and maybe you all know this, but I can't tell you how many times, especially during a non-virtual semester where I'll have a student email me and say, what are your office hours? And that's fine. I'm happy to respond to that, but also they're posted on Google courses and the syllabus. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's that, that information that's out there. So part of that is like, you all have read through the syllabus, you know what information is in there. So if you have a question about a due date, you know you can go to the syllabus on the last page and it gives you the due dates. I'll also post those on Cougar courses. I will also, the other thing I'll say, I send a lot of email reminders. Typically every week, you're gonna get an email every Monday and every Thursday or Friday. And if you have an assignment due, you will get an email a day or two before that assignment is due. Communication in this virtual environment is extremely important for success. Sometimes those emails will be quick and short. Other times the Monday emails are gonna be kind of an update of like, here's where we are. Here's what you need to do this week. Don't forget this. Make sure you're reading those and going through those. And if you have questions, reaching out to me because they will be a source to make sure you're on top of it. If you know like, okay, this week we have this coming up, so I need to go and do this and so on. The other thing too, is if there's anything on Cougar courses, I've done my best to make the formatting of Cougar courses as user-friendly as possible. I personally do not like Cougar courses very much. It's not the best environment, especially for teaching completely virtually. So I've done my best to kind of make it easy to follow through for what you need to do for each week and where to find things. But if there are suggestions you have for things that would help you do well in this class, email me. And if it's something I think I can integrate, I'll do my best to integrate it. Cool. Well, let's take a break till 1030. I know that's only a couple of minutes, but 
Um, we only have about 30 minutes left of some lecture stuff. We're gonna take a few minute break um, and then uh, come back at 1030 and then finish up for today. We'll get started again in just uh, about 30 seconds or so. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have some PowerPoint slides to go through today. Um, everything that will be in this PowerPoint slides, I will post these separate ones as well, because these are a little bit different than what I have posted on Google courses right now. Um, everything um, is in the asynchronous lectures as well though, as I mentioned. And so you can uh, watch the lectures there as well. Um, but we're just gonna kind of do a little bit of an introduction to epidemiology. Our objectives for today are to, to define public health, define epidemiology, describe why epidemiology is the foundation of public health, and then just talk about a little bit of the differences between some of the types of epidemiology and so on. So 
First things is epidemiology fits within this larger field of public health. And there's this really long definition on the slide right now. You're not gonna be expected to memorize or to know all the words in this definition or anything, but public health as a field, as you can see in the definition is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health. And it has all of these other things through community effort, through sanitation of the environment, through control of communicable infections, such as through control of COVID-19, through the education of people in personal hygiene and about things that affect their health, through the organization of medical and nursing services for early diagnosis and prevention of disease, and through development of the social machinery to ensure that every individual in the community has standard of living adequate for maintenance of health. So public health's role in the nation, in the world, is to ensure that everyone is able to protect their individual health and the health of their community. One of the things that's unique to public health that most of you are familiar with medicine as a field. So you've all most likely been to a doctor at some point or seen nurses and so on. Medical field all deals with treating individuals who are sick. So you get an illness, you go to the doctor, they diagnose you and they treat you. Public health as a field, on the other hand, is dealing with populations and preventing of health issues before they happen in the first place. So our goal in the field of public health is to understand the health of the communities and to put things in place to prevent illness from happening in the first place. So before someone has to go to a doctor, but on top of that, that if someone needs to go to the doctor to ensure that they have access to that doctor, to the right doctor, to be able to treat their current illness and prevent future illness from happening as a result of whatever happened in the first place. And so public health is really the system that we have in place to protect the health of our communities and the population as a whole. So in the field of epidemiology and in the field of public health, we're dealing with populations and we're, uh, and we're dealing with things that can affect the most people possible, as opposed to in the field of medicine, they're dealing with individuals and saying, what can I do for this one individual that's sitting in front of me with this particular symptom and what can I give them to prevent that? So um, the core functions of public health are to assess the health of the community. So what does the health look like? Who's getting disease? Where is it happening? When is it happening? Why is it happening? To develop policies based on scientific knowledge. So all of our policies that we develop in this country and Um, professor, I think your sound cut off. Um, we can't hear you. I don't think you can hear us. Okay, you guys hear me? Yes. All right, sorry, my microphone decided to just uh, cut out on me. So I don't know where I cut out, but these are the three core functions of public health. Hopefully it was on this slide <laughs> that I cut out on. Um, and so their, their assessment, policy development and assurance, assessment being for assessing the health of a community, who has disease, when is it happening, where is it happening, Policy development is developing policies based on the best scientific evidence and assurance being that public health services are provided to the community so that the right people have access to the services that they need to protect their health. All right, so um, what is epidemiology then and how does it fit within this field of public health? 
So before, you know, the next slide, and if you've watched the ACU Venus lectures, you've probably seen the definition that I give for epidemiology. But the questions I have for you all, and I want you to chat it in, or you can unmute yourself as well. Two, two kind of questions. One is kind of what, what to you, what do you think epidemiology is as a field? And more than that, before the COVID-19 pandemic started, had you ever heard of epidemiology or what did you think epidemiology was? And I ask that because in the last year, you know, more people are aware of what epidemiology is. It's been in the news, it's been in articles and so on. Um, and so I want to get a perception of where, what you all think it is and how it can be used before I move forward. So if you can chat it in or if anyone wants to unmute themselves, what is epidemiology and has that changed since the start of the pandemic? study of health and disease. There's more than one of you in this class. <laughs> I didn't know anything about it, but epidemiology always reminded me of an EpiPen. So I figured it was something that had to do with like the health of others, or I guess, or us, a population. Yeah. That's actually the first time I've heard the, the EpiPen one. So that's, that's interesting. I always thought that uh, epidemiology was solely the like tracking of infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, and that's often because that's what we hear about uh, most often actually is when we're tracking infectious diseases because we hear about outbreaks um, and we hear about kind of like COVID, we hear about measles, or we hear about all of these other things, but we don't kind of hear about uh, as much epidemiology's role for chronic diseases, which it plays a huge role for chronic diseases. study of health and disease, preventative medicine, study of diseases, understanding. Cool. So yeah, I think you're all kind of on the right track and I'm guessing that much of your perception and knowledge of epidemiology has kind of been shaped by this last year. Um, before the pandemic happened, when I would ask students what epidemiology was, one, uh, I would get a lot of answers and I want you all to be honest if anybody ever thought this, I, and I still get this actually, when I tell people I'm an epidemiologist, people will say, oh, do you study the skin? And that's because they, they hear epidemiology and then they think epidermis. So then they think, oh, epidemiology is to study, study the skin. And I'm like, actually, no, I don't really know that much about the skin, <laughs> except for like wear sunscreen, it protects you. <laughs> um, and, and, and so it's not, study of skin is, and that stuff is dermatology. Um, epidemiology, the root word in epidemiology is epidemic. And so what we're looking for is basically the study of what befalls upon populations. And, and so my definition of epidemiology and the formal definition that I want you all to know is, oh, you have a family member who's an epidemiologist at CDC. That's pretty awesome. Love to chat about that. Um, the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states or events in human populations. And actually, um, that can be in animal populations as well and the application of this study to prevent and control health problems. So our goal in epidemiology is to understand how disease is spread. Um, and so that means who's getting disease, where is it happening geographically, when is it happening? That's all descriptive epidemiology and understanding the distribution. Determinants refers to what it is that's causing disease. So if somebody smokes, how do we know that smoking causes lung cancer? And what does it mean to say smoking causes lung cancer? And so we wanna um, understand the factors that both impact and negatively affect our health, but also at the same time, and somebody put this in the chat too, we also wanna know what protects our health as well so that we can not only recommend things that can help people improve their health, but we can recommend things that people avoid that might affect their health negatively. Um, so those distribution determinants um, are really the key pieces about epidemiology, describing spread of disease and understanding why it's spreading and how we can prevent it and control it to mitigate the long-term effects of it. So for example, with COVID-19, 
doing things like social distancing, wearing masks and all of those things are mitigation or prevention and control measures to slow down the spread of COVID-19. Their effectiveness for many, 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 many reasons that we won't go into have been very limited in the last year, um, but those are considered prevention and control measures. And as I mentioned, so this definition specifically says human populations, but um, epidemiology is, is, is done with uh, environmental factors, with animals as well. So I actually have a really good friend who is a wildlife epidemiologist and she works for the uh, San Diego Zoo in uh, Safari Park. And so she understands, she, she does research to look at the spread of disease in animals. And what's extremely important about that actually, and we'll talk about this a little bit in, later on in the semester when we talk specifically about infectious disease epidemiology, is that a large number and the majority of infectious diseases that humans are affected by uh, uh, happen through this process called zoonosis, where they're actually spread from animals to humans. And the current prevailing theory is that that is what happened for COVID-19 as well. And that happens via our interactions with animals. Humans are continually encroaching on the environment and moving into spaces where they never were and becoming uh, having more and more interactions with animals in many different ways. And those interactions lead to the spread of pathogens that those pathogens eventually evolve and adapt to be able to affect human populations such as COVID-19. Other examples are uh, avian influenza, HIV, and many other infectious diseases that we all know about and have heard about um, are spread to humans from animals as a result of our encroachment on their environment and how we interact with them. So that is actually a very important part of the field of epidemiology as well. So, Epidemiology is the foundation of public health because it is the research site of public health. So in epidemiology, we conduct research through doing different types of research studies that we'll learn about throughout this semester to assess and monitor the health of communities and populations, to form public policies that are meant to solve and identify local and national health issues and priorities, and to assure that all populations have access to appropriate and cost-effective care. And so we want to use epidemiology to address those three core functions of public health to protect the health of our populations. There are two broad types of epidemiology that we'll talk about throughout the semester, and those are descriptive epidemiology and analytic epidemiology. Descriptive epidemiology is really the describing the distribution of disease in the population. It's the who's getting infected, where is it happening, what is it, and when is it happening. And that when is important too because we have some diseases that are seasonal, such as influenza, where they happen in the winter months versus uh, in the summer months we don't have much influenza. And so understanding that timing aspect of disease becomes really important too. Analytic epidemiology is the why and how. So it is why are certain people getting infected with disease? Or how is this happening? Or why are there higher mortality rates for certain diseases for certain populations than others? So for example, why do Black and Latin X uh, people in the United States die at much higher rates from COVID-19 than uh, their white counterparts? And the reason being, and we'll talk about a little of this uh, next, uh, next week, is largely as a result of racism and discrimination and the types of jobs that they have and all these policies that are put into place that affect how people interact in many different ways that influence not only their likelihood to get infected with COVID-19, but also their likelihood to get care and the right care to prevent mortality. So these are all the types of things that we want to think about when we think about disease. So we solve problems through surveillance and research. The most important thing for understanding the health of population is uh, through doing surveillance. And we'll have a short lecture in a couple of weeks that'll talk about surveillance. And surveillance is really that understanding the health and, and examining people to see how many people in the population have diabetes, how many people have heart disease, how many people have HIV, so that we can get a descriptive picture of what uh, the spread of disease looks like throughout the United States. And then we do, so that's descriptive epidemiology. We do assessment to assess what, where we are right now. We determine why and how that's happening through analytic epidemiology. And then we develop interventions to prevent that. 
So there's a couple of underlying assumptions that we all have to kind of understand and be on the same page for to move forward with uh, understanding epidemiology. And those key underlying assumptions are that illness and disease are not randomly distributed in human populations, but rather individuals may have characteristics that either predispose or protect them from illness or disease and communities, neighborhoods, cultures, and populations also have characteristics that either predispose or protect them from illness. Illness, if, if illness was randomly distributed in the population, we would never be able to understand the why and how. Why is it that people develop cancer? Why is it that people get infected with HIV or how is it happening and so on? There are still a lot of questions that are yet to be answered about many things that affect our health, but we, have, we make this assumption that there are factors that we can identify at both the individual and the community level that put people at risk for adverse health outcomes. And on the flip side, there are things that we can do that can prevent those things from adversely affecting people's health by putting into place policies and interventions and doing education and other things to help people make informed decisions about their health. So these are some of the assumptions that we make. And I also mentioned that we're focusing on population health as a whole. So for the most part, research that we conduct in epidemiology, it is looking at how is this gonna impact our entire population versus how is it gonna impact me as an individual? So we're not typically doing research rice where we're saying, if I do these things, what is going to happen? We're saying, if on average, the population does these things, what's gonna to happen to their health overall? And that's important because one of the things that we'll talk about is understanding what leads to adverse health out, uh, outcomes in our population is complicated. And most diseases have what we call multiple causes, meaning that, for example, for someone who develops type 2 diabetes, every single case of type 2 diabetes is different, where for one person, they might have developed type 2 diabetes because they had a family history of type 2 diabetes and they were physically inactive. Another person might have been physically active in some ways, but had a family history and had a poor diet and had other things that led to their type 2 diabetes. So there are multiple potential causes that interact with each other that we can identify to understand how overall they play a role in future disease outcomes. And what you'll notice throughout this semester as well, and one of the things that makes epidemiology most exciting to me is that it's interdisciplinary, meaning that the field of epidemiology pulls from many different areas, whether that is biology, or virology, or sociology, or statistics, or whatever, psychology, or whatever other field it is. In epidemiology, we use theories and we use um, things that we know from all of these fields to understand and protect the health of the population. So that's what makes it so exciting to me is there's many different directions that you can take within the field of epidemiology to both understand the health of the population, but also to put into place interventions and measures to protect the health of the population. So some of the last things that we'll go through before we end today um, is that there's a couple of also current conceptual movements that we'll talk about throughout this semester and that will help to dictate a lot of what we think about health for this class. And those are the eco-social perspective and the life course perspective. The eco-social perspective on population health suggests that policies, institutions, and characteristics of contact contribute to shaping health. And I'll describe that more in a minute. And the life course perspective says that determinants of health are distributed across our life course and even before conception. So what this all means taking together is that in epidemiology, we understand causes of population of health across levels of influence from cells to society and across our entire lifespan. So if we look at that in a figure, if you see in this figure across, there's this uh, loop that goes around that says life course. 
And then there's all of these boxes and we can look down here at this individual health, this oval that says individual and population health. Our individual health and the health of the communities that we live in and of our families is impacted by all of those levels above us, whether that is pathophysiologic pathways and genetics or constitutional factors, whether that is individual behaviors that we engage in, such as whether or not we're physically active or our diet or whether or not we um, smoke tobacco or some other things, but all of those individual behaviors. And one thing that I will stress a lot is that our individual behaviors are shaped by the environments that surround us and by our social relationships, by our living conditions, by the neighborhoods and communities that we live in. So for example, um, one of the things that we'll talk about a lot throughout this semester is um, physical activity. So what influences physical activity levels? So I guess that's a question I have for you. What influences whether or not people can be physically active? Why, why are people physically active? Why aren't people physically active? So if you I think a large more... portion that affects, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. So I think a large portion that affects that is access, um, whether it's like weather or the area around you, whether it's safe to recreate or not, um, that can affect it too. And it's also um, like education on physical activity. There's just a lack of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. So education, people argue they don't have time to. And, and that's actually a common thing that people will say, I don't have time. Um, but then when you look at actually a person's day, they often will have enough time. But really, it's more. And, and I'm glad with, with Mike, with your answer and some of the things, availability of gyms and other things, often physical activity levels are shaped well before somebody is thinking about whether or not they want to be physically active. Whether that is that physical activity is not um, uh, promoted in their culture or in their community, or they live in a community or a neighborhood where it's not safe to be physically active outside. So say you want to go out and be physically active and you can't afford a gym or there's not a gym in your neighborhood. So then you want to go be physically active, but there's a, your neighborhood's unsafe. There's a lot of violence or a lot of... Uh, you don't want to work out at night because of many different factors. So those are all things that affect whether or not somebody can engage in physical activity. And those are all influenced by policies that we have that say, if you live in a neighborhood, what's the closest park to you? Is that park clean? Is there things for you to be able to do to be physically active? And in many neighborhoods, there aren't parks. They're kind of concrete jungles. And those are all based on policies and how those neighborhoods were built and who lives in those neighborhoods and how funding is allocated through them. So physical activity is not just a lack of motivation or an individual problem. It's actually this larger problem that's created by societal structure, the built environment that we live in and policies that are put into place that influence an individual's ability to and decisions to make uh, that decision to be able to be physically active. So there are so many things that influence our own individual, even just physical activity, let alone other behaviors that we put into, uh, that we will engage in as well. And those are all influenced by social and economic policies. So I told you we can't take pol political stuff out of public health because something like our access to a park, that's a political decision and how funding is allocated for making parks in different neighborhoods. The quality of our education where you grow up and the socioeconomic status of the neighborhood that you live in is gonna affect the quality of the school that you went to and the number of resources that you have available to you when you're uh, uh, younger. And so people who grow up in lower socioeconomic status neighborhoods, their schools are less well-funded. So from the time they start preschool to kindergarten, if preschool is even available, they're, they're already put at a disadvantage because there's less funding available, there's larger class sizes, there's less resources and other things that help prepare students to move through their K through 12 education and let alone move on to a college education. So those policies around how education is funded and how it's allocated in different neighborhoods affect our health in the long run and affect how we're able to not only be socially mobile and access different career options and other things, but they affect the world that surrounds us. So what I want you all to think about throughout this semester as we talk about different things that affect our health is 
how these things all play together and how when we look at that life course approach, that oval that was going around the whole thing, how these how we interact with these things throughout our entire lives, starting from even before we were conceived, where there are times where things that your mother or your father were exposed to can have affected your health today. Things that your mother was exposed to while she was pregnant with you may have affected your health today. Breastfeeding decisions and ability to breastfeed because of many different reasons, physical activity levels when you were young, access to education when you were young, all of these things that you see on this slide that go through, that we experience and that we're exposed to throughout our lives, those all kind of are accumulated risk and things that impact our health and things that might happen to us today. And so we have to think about it from this very uh, broad picture of it's not just what am I doing right now that's affecting my health, but it's how do the things that I've been exposed to and the environments that I live in and the conditions that I've uh, experience, how do those uh, not only impact my individual health, but the health of the communities that surround me. These are all important aspects of health, and we'll talk about throughout this semester how we understand and conduct research on those uh, in those different areas and what they mean for population health as a whole. And so we're going to, I'm going to kind of skip through some of this because we just don't have time because I just talked too much today. Um, apologies for that. And I'll, I'll say that a lot. Sometimes I just kind of talk and I just talk way too much. I'm going to try to limit that as much as possible throughout these live sessions, but we'll do that next week. Um, and we'll do a couple of other things early next week too, where we'll talk about some of the ways that disease is distributed and how we determine what affects health um, of the population next week as well and go through a couple of exercises. Um, but otherwise, before we end today, what questions do you have for me? So as I've said, feel free to reach out to me via email. Uh, my goal will always be to respond to your emails within 24 hours. Most of the time that will be much quicker. If I do not respond to you within 24 hours, that likely means that I missed your email for some reason. Never hesitate to follow up and say, hey, I emailed you and I didn't get a response. I would rather that than you be waiting and waiting and waiting and wondering when and if I'm going to respond. Um, I usually try to respond to emails within a couple of hours unless I'm in a whole slew of meetings for the day. Um, so email me with questions, uh, other kind of things for you all to do. Complete the syllabus quiz if you have not already. I noticed that about seven or eight of you have already scheduled your uh, first office hour with me at some point in the next week or so. So make sure that you're doing that as well and looking through my availability on um, Calendly or emailing me or just coming to my normal office hours, um, which are posted on Cougar courses and on the syllabus. And then before next week, there are, so I guess the other last thing I'll say is this first couple of weeks, there's a little bit more content of asynchronous stuff in terms of recorded lectures and stuff, because I'm trying to kind of get us up to speed of some of that background stuff that we need for the rest of the semester. So this first two or three weeks might feel a little bit more content heavy. It will actually taper down after that and there'll be less recorded stuff and readings and stuff that you'll have to do once we've kind of built this little bit of a foundation. Um, so that won't continue the whole time, but as always reach out to me if you need anything, I'm always available via email. We can schedule a time to jump on Zoom or on the phone or whatever works well for you. And um, otherwise we'll go from there. It was great to see you all kind of virtually, or at least see your names on the screen. If you need anything, I'm available. Have a great rest of your uh, first week and weekend, and I will see you all next uh, Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.